We have a pretty church where people want things to be nice. We have beautiful flower beds. We have plants that bloom every season of the year. Our church likes to have lots of plants that look the same, and we plant them in long straight rows. We like to think that we are in control. Sometime you might be looking at the beautiful flowers and noticing all the blossoms and how busy the bees are investigating every single bloom. Then, as you look closer, you might see other plants growing in the flower beds too. This is nut sedge, and we call it a weed. You might see a little grapevine growing in with the liriope. Or you may notice that even the azaleas have a big grapevine growing on top of them. If you walk behind the office building, you'll see a thorny greenbrier vine crawling over the hedge full of blossoms. There's even a young tree sprouting and growing up through the middle of the hedge. That's not the way we want our church to look. We want everything to look just the way it always has. But God is planting new seeds all the time. We may call them weeds and want them pulled out. But birds and squirrels that planted the seeds call them food. Without constantly planting new seeds like this acorn, we wouldn't have new young trees like this oak seedling that one day will take the place of our big oak trees sheltering Tennyson Church. Good morning. Our Bible reading for today is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 43. To give you a little background, Jesus was talking to the people in parables. And at one point, his disciples asked him, Lord, why are you speaking in parables? And Jesus said to them, Though seeing, they do not see. And though hearing, they don't, under they don't understand or hear. The prophecy of Isaiah is now being fulfilled. You disciples have God blessed eyes and ears. And so he told another parable, starting with verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And went away. When the wheat sprouted and heads formed, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in the branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took 
and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parables of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. One of my chores when I was little was to pluck tumbleweed sprouts out of the front yard grass at our house in El Paso. And those little things were prolific. And with a strong wind in West Texas, those seeds would scatter abundantly and easily. And it seems that weeds must do this. They have to adapt to survive. Some can lie dormant for years and years before they finally sprout in just the right condition tumbleweeds, on the other hand, on the opposite approach, can have their seeds germinate in as little as 36 minutes. Well, a man named Edward Salisbury, who was fascinated by weeds, grew over 300 weeds and plants out of the debris found in the cuff of his trousers. So I found this cool new book, and it's all about weeds. Michael Maybe wrote it, and in the very first part of the book, he says this, Plants become weeds when they obstruct our plans or our tidy maps of the world. If you have no such plans or maps, they can appear as innocence without stigma or blame. 
But with weeds, context is everything. Any plant growing in shabby surroundings becomes a weed. They're the victims of guilt by association and seen as sharing the dubious character of the company they keep. If plants sprout through garbage, they become a kind of litter themselves. So the best known and simplest definition is that a weed is a plant in the wrong place. That is a plant growing where you would prefer other plants to grow, or sometimes no plants at all. Matthew's gospel can be a little tricky to understand and some of the old traditional explanations might not work or fit sometimes. And for example, in this parable, why is this landowner, someone who has servants to do the farming, out spreading seed around himself? And how does he know that an enemy sowed evil seed? And why does he decide to let all of that evil wheat grow right along with all the good wheat? The weed in question here is what some believe to be darnel, which can look a little bit like wheat when it's growing until it's mature. Wheat grain heads will lean over from the weight of the grain, but darnel grain stays upright, their stalks stay straight. Well, modern technology can easily separate those two plants from each other and the seeds. But the workers in this story are waiting to do what they know needs to be done, and that is the typical way of doing things. They want permission to go out and remove the weeds. But the owner, God, has a wisdom they can't see, a different perspective they do not think about. He recognizes that there could be unintended consequences if the workers go out and remove the weeds. And when it comes to people, how do any of us truly know what is good and what is evil? It is those who are absolutely certain that they do know who often do the most damage, especially when it comes to church. Caroline Lewis said, when we start going down the road of making our lot in life, electing what is good and evil, we may very well discover that others will be making similar conclusions about us. But there is another thought to consider here. What if the good and evil spoken of in this parable are combined in every single one of us? This would certainly fit Paul's way of thinking. What if every single human has the capacity to be evil sometimes? And what if every city has good and evil? What if every job has good and evil? How in the world would any of us have the skill to separate the good from the bad? And frankly, those who do try are usually terribly destructive. The Bible can help us understand this. Jesus says no to the idea of tearing out weeds. Then he says, forgive them to grow together until the harvest. The word there is, the Greek word is afite, which um, can be permit or allow or let, but most often in the Bible is translated as forgive. And if the meaning of this parable is teaching us that there is evil in each and every human, then anyone trying to rid that person of evil may very well damage that entire person. Remember Peter? In chapter 16 of Matthew, Jesus sees Satan in Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. But Jesus does not throw Peter out, does he? Peter evolves into the rock and a champion for God in the world. Saul, who persecutes the world of Christians with zeal, had plenty of evil in him, but Jesus did not give up on Saul either. Jesus converted him, and Saul became Paul, another champion for the church. Maybe part of what we should get out of this parable is that there are always parts of life that are not the way we would like. Maybe we should hear that people aren't always how we want them to be. Maybe we should hear that things are not always as clear as we would like them to be. And if this is the case, then we should also hear this parable say that in everything, people, jobs, places, cities, governments, and marriages, we can trust that God will sort it out. When things are unclear, mixed up, or confusing, we can count on God to work it out. And God is the only one who can. David Lowe's said, this doesn't mean everything will turn out just fine. Sometimes we don't choose well. Sometimes things go wrong, 
The promise here isn't that Christian faith prevents hardship. The promise is that we are not justified by our right choices, but by the grace of God through faith. And knowing we have God's unconditional love in spite of our poor choices sets us free. The thing is, you see, that we don't live in an ideal world and each week we're faced with a whole lot of challenging decisions, some small and others large. In some, there's no clear answer. Some decisions will get right and others will get wrong. Still others, we won't know whether we are right or wrong, maybe for months or even years to come. Another thing to notice in this parable is that it is the angels who separate the good people from the evil. It is not, not, not any human who is in charge of this work. Now, I emphasize this because there are so many church people who feel that it is their personal duty to rid the world of anyone they believe is evil. I know many pastors who think this way. And while all of us probably know someone we wish that God would kind of deal with, this passage is warning us to never take those matters into our own hands. It is not our job. My theory is that this is a major stumbling block for the church. I know a good bit of history, and I think this problem has surfaced many times, but perhaps the most troubling and insidious of those times was the Great Reformation in the time that Luther and other greats of the church spoke up and said the church was not what it should be. And the church was called out for its evil and shockwaves went through the world. On the surface, it may have looked like the church would regroup, do some soul searching and recover a biblical outlook on its function. And in many ways it did, but there was an enemy present watching that field of new beginnings. There was an enemy there who was planting seeds meant to disrupt the future promise, the hopeful and optimistic view that the church would be what God wanted it to be. That enemy threw seeds out that took the one church, watched with glee as that one church grew, looking so similar, but it wasn't. It was brimming with denominations. It was overloaded with branches who would all say they were right and true and that every other branch was not right and true. Sharon Watkins is the general minister and president of the uh, Christian church, which is the Disciples of Christ. And she wrote this. All too often, the image of people have of Christianity is one of narrowness rather than inclusion, judgment rather than acceptance of different points of view fear rather than love. And the truth is that we Christians have a lot of work to do. We are not as good as we should be at showing the world what this God of love is like. We shall fall short of being the best possible ambassadors of that love. Remember that every church member in the Methodist church who joins the church makes two confessions. We believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we will resist evil in whatever form it comes in. And most of us think about the evil out there as the evil around us, but not very many, if any, look within to see what is in our own hearts. Resisting evil doesn't re equate to removing it. What God asks Christians to do is bear fruit. Remember that old saying, God expects spiritual fruit, not religious nuts? I'm willing to bet that most people who read this passage will somewhere inside believe that they are, of course, good wheat, and then start to think about all the suspected people out there that are not good wheat. And we can't think that way. Do you remember Oskar Schindler, the German industrialist who saved over a thousand Polish Jews from concentration camps in World War II? One of the people he saved said of him, he was our father, our mother, our only hope. He would never let us down. Yet many who saw the film, Schindler's List, were surprised, if not quite put off by this man's vice vices. He was a man who had all kinds of vices. He was no saint. He was riddled with contradictions, unfaithful to his wife. He knew how to enjoy cigars, drink, women. He was a Roman Catholic, but only in name. He was a member of the Nazi party, and his aim was to end the war with two trunks full of money. 
he exploited the Jews as a source of cheap labor. But there was another and better side to him. And in spite of his lapses, he always returned to that better side. There was basic goodness about him. And as the war went on, he became appalled at the horrors of the final solution and considerable personal risk because he was arrested twice. He protected his workers from the death camps. So if we decide on our own to deal with someone, anyone, that we believe to be an evil weed in our world, we are making a mistake. The process of becoming godly is not one that happens overnight. And it is not our job to decide who is evil and who is not. It is our job to be patient, to watch people grow, to help them grow, to nourish them along. But this process has a dangerous downside. If we do not continue to grow ourselves, we will only settle for people who are like us. We will hit the invisible wall that runners know all too well. We will see this church stop growing. We will see this, the church start crumbling. We will see the church settle for mediocre, settle for status quo, and settle for fruitlessness. And we should not be willing to accept this. I pray that we can be the church that does not judge, that does not fight, is not hypocritical, and is not judgmental. But I pray that we can be the church that invites, helps, nurtures, and guides other fellow weeds to transformation and honest to goodness, actual fruit. Let's be that church. Amen.